Tina Kote Katoa, I'm Dr. Si Rockman and I've been an environmental scientist for over 20 years and I've adapted the UK's Extinction Rebellion talk to from a scientist's perspective and to the values and contexts of our beautiful Aotearoa. In light of the recent terror attacks in Christchurch, it's really important to open with the core principle of Extinction Rebellion. We welcome the grief that we feel when our home and everything we love is under attack. And many of us, many of us also feel grief about the impending climate change and mass extinction catastrophe. In Extinction Rebellion, we acknowledge that we're in a place beyond hope and fear, and this gives us the ability to start direct action. So I'd like to frame this talk on Simon Sinek's golden circle, starting with our why the motivation of why we are here and why you're listening to this talk. I'm going to start with my why in relation to both mass extinction and climate change. So what is my why? Um, I grew up in a landlocked country in Austria, but since I first saw the ocean in Croatia at age three, I was completely mesmerized. All I wanted to be is just like Jacques Cousteau diving coral reefs around the world and save the ocean. So I moved to Australia and I became a coral reef ecologist. I did my PhD in Papua New Guinea and I studied the impact of a massive gold mine on the surrounding reef. When I moved to New Zealand, I switched to working on energy efficiency and behavior change. And I started my own research consultancy in 2011 and have been leading the first global behavior change research collaboration for the International Energy Agency ever since then. So I basically changed from studying the symptom, which is human impact on coral reefs, to studying the cause, which is human and corporate behavior. But even though I now get to focus on solutions rather than just a problem, this doesn't insulate me from the utter heartbreak that I feel when I see everything that I love die. So I cry when I see my former hard-nosed coral reef professor, Terry Hughes, on the evening news in Australia crying because the Great Barrier Reef is dying. The Great Barrier Reef is a canary in the coal mine or gold mine, and it is bleaching at a rate that it cannot replenish itself even if it does recover. It is one of the oldest and largest living structures in the world. It's the only living structure you can see from space. And in 200 years of our over rampant overconsumption of fossil fuels, we have pushed it to the brink of extinction. Even though coral reefs only cover 2% of the planet, they actually are the home of 25% of all species that live in the ocean. Two billion people are directly dependent on coral reefs, largely in developing countries like Papua New Guinea or Southeast Asia. And we literally cannot live without coral reefs because other really important marine ecosystems like seagrass beds and mangroves are also directly linked to the healthy coral reef. I was also privileged enough to be uh, part of the largest female scientist expedition to Antarctica in 2017 and I released a crack in there. I saw climate change in action with my own eyes being in Antarctica. The West Antarctic ice shelf is another canary and a few months after we passed through it the Larsen Sea ice shelf broke off and became the largest iceberg the world has ever seen. Over a trillion tons of ice over 200 meters thick. So I don't need to believe in climate change in the sixth mass extinction because I know it is a fact. I've studied it all my professional life. And I'm so pissed off that I and much more eminent scientists than me have said that this is going to happen over decades and it has made not a lot of a difference. Um, we take no joy in being able to say that we told you so. Most of us suffer from what is called pre-traumatic stress disorder. Because we collect the proof that everything we love and want to protect is dying in front of our eyes every day. I and most environmental scientists that I know will do have no more hope that we can just turn a corner or that there will be a silver bullet technology that will just save us all or that coral reefs will just suddenly learn to adapt or that the climate will suddenly go into a cooling cycle. <sighs> Having no hope also means we have no fear. We now have no fear saying what we know is right and what we know is wrong and I have no fear in fighting for our planet, for other species and for future generations. I have no fear in standing up to all the powers that want to continue on our current cause. 
which will bring us to exactly what we have been saying is going to happen faster than we could ever envisage it. And I know that many of you who watch this will also feel the same. So what is your why? It'd be good to think about your own why and share it with someone that you think has similar feelings and thoughts and feels the same grief. It's important to keep our why at the forefront of what we do, as it will determine how we do it, if we can see it through and if we will be able to get others to join us. I will now very briefly go over some of the latest signs around global climate change and what it means for New Zealand. I've received input from our two preeminent scientists, Professor James Renwick, um, a climate change professor at Victoria University, and Dr. Mike Joy, a freshwater ecologist, also at Victoria. Um, I don't do this to prove to you that what I'm talking about is a reality, because this is well established. It is just that the urgency and the extent of the impact and the catastrophic prediction of what the future holds are often downplayed by the media and by our politicians. Our scientists by profession are very conservative in how we state our facts. I don't always agree with that. But when scientists like my old coral reef professor Terry Hughes do speak up, they often get accused of cherry picking or of being greedy and just wanting to get more research money by catastrophizing. More often than not, these scientists seem to get proven right in their catastrophizing, unfortunately. Like Terry was with the Great Barrier Reef dying or Mike Joy has been with the huge freshwater extinction that we're facing here in New Zealand. One climate change denier scientist whose paper, the fossil fuel lobby, does not deserve to get the same treatment as thousands of climate change and environmental scientists who say the opposite. But that is still how our media is often treating this. I was one over 15,000 scientists who signed the second warning to humanity. The first one was written by scientists in 1992. And nobody listened. Scientists are now also writing many papers warning of the individual issues that are coming home to roast fast. It's time to listen to them. The most important scientific vo voice comes from big collaborations like the IPCC, the International Panel for Climate Change, which includes thousands of scientists. But their predictions are also very much on the cautious side. By the time the Iron and IPCC report, even the most extreme predictions have started to happen in real life because there's a time lag where environmental change is now progressing to the next phase faster than the IPCC reporting cycle can catch up with. This graph really shows the difficulty with the IPCC process and why relying on it is getting us into real trouble fast. It is the melting of the Arctic sea ice showing the September minimum. And in red, you can see the actual observations. What this, like so many other models and forecasts, clearly show is that the data is way off the models. The IPCC models are missing something that is causing the current observations and data to depart from the predictions. The real-time data gives us no time to waste, and that is very clear. You may know this graph. It shows the range of global average temperatures over the last 800,000 years with re regular fluctuations that were accompanied with ice ages and interglacial periods. So now if you check what happened to CO2 in the last few decades, to put this in perspective, the last time the atmosphere had 400 parts per million was 3 million years ago when humans did not exist. In 140 years, which is your grandchildren's lifetime, the level of CO2 will be the highest that it has been in 56 million years when palm trees and crocodiles were in the Arctic. The rise in temperature above pre-industrial levels is now at approximately 1 degree Celsius and rising fast and faster. The UN has just said that we now have locked in a rise in the Arctic average temperature of 3 to 5 degrees, for sure. One of the big issues with climate change is that there are feedback loops, and these aren't accounted for in the IPCC models. The albedo effect, which is shown here, is just one of them. That's why climate change isn't simply a matter of cause and effect, but it's a vicious circle that will only get more vicious with time. We're also not just talking about single feedback loops, but domino effects that are cascading from different feedback loops, all of which have tipping points that, when they are reached, kick off runaway climate change. And that is when it gets the Earth into a hothouse state. It's quite possible there are 10 positive feedback loops that were studied that basically tell us that things that are usually carbon sinks are going to become carbon sources, and they're pumping more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, fueling each other. 
This can lead to abrupt climate change, and that's when changes happen very quickly and become irreversible because of this runaway effect. And a lot of what we're seeing already is way worse than the predictions. And we should start to be really alarmed because our scientists are. What this picture shows is that an increase of two degrees, which is what the Paris Climate Accord is about, and which we're far away from tracking towards right now, would be enough to tip the Earth into this permanent hothouse state. It would mean the end of coral reefs, of Arctic summer sea ice, of alpine glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet with its incredible sea level rise that comes with that. Also, the West Antarctic ice sheet, which I've seen break off, is going to be under threat at 2 degrees. Even at 1.5 degrees, which would basically mean stopping all fossil fuel use now, it isn't a great move. Scientists are now so worried that we're actually calling for such drastic measures, which is why we're supporting Extinction Rebellion. It doesn't help that this extreme response that we now need could have been entirely avoided if scientists would have been listened to 30 years ago and the fossil fuel lobby's disinformation campaign wouldn't have had such weight with the powers to be. We have enough of being seen as impotent Cassandras. The world's top scientists, like this guy, Professor Schellenhuber, are now speaking out in the most urgent and catastrophic language. It's time to listen because it's not just about climate change. Extinction Rebellion is not just about climate change. Because we've also managed to kick off the sixth mass extinction with our fossil fuel addiction. Humanity has wiped out 60% of all mammals, birds, fish and reptiles since 1970. This led the world's foremost experts to warn that the annihilation of wildlife is now an emergency that threatens our civilization. This is mostly due to land use and not to global warming and it'll get worse because this is just the beginning. We know of five major mass extinction events that, has hap that have happened in the Earth in the past, and all but one were caused by rapidly rising CO2. The Permian-Triassic extinction, the most devastating of all, which lost 97% of all species, also had runaway feedback loops, which led to hydrogen sulfate literally gassing the atmosphere. The rate of CO2 rise today is similar to what happened then. So the extinction of all human life and most species is highly likely on this current trajectory that we're on. It is really important to note that this is the first time in the history of the Earth that a sentient species has kicked off a mass extinction event. Let that sink in. So what about the possibility of human extinction? We are already heading towards three degrees and possibly five degrees, the way we're going right now in our lifetime. This paper said that there is a 1 in 20 chance that the CO2 in the atmosphere now could cause an existential threat to our civilization. We don't even know how bad it would be at 5 degrees because it's pretty much unimaginable, but even 3 degrees by 2050, which is what we're tracking on, is utterly catastrophic because that is in the lifetime of your children. So what does it mean for our Aotearoa? Here you can see the rapid retreat of our West Coast glaciers. I don't know if you've seen the West Coast glaciers, but when I first moved to New Zealand in 2004, I went there and it was, a, it was a short walk to get to see the ice. In 2016, when I went there again, I walked for over an hour and I had to turn back because I'm now a Kiwi and I was in shorts and flip flops, jandals, and um, I couldn't get anywhere near even seeing the ice. Mike Joy says that we're finally waking up to the fact that our glaciers are being lost at an alarming rate because this has flow-in effects in our rivers and lakes, of course. The loss of glacier ice will also mean that there's less fresh water coming down in the spring melt, and that means less water for irrigation, which of course our economy is very much dependent on. But it also means that our rivers and groundwater table are pushed to the brink and our lake levels are now lowered, seeing that most of our renewable electricity comes from the hydro lakes down south. This is a real problem to our electricity system as well. Professor James Renwick says that at two degrees of warming, which we are tracking beyond, we will have a tripling number of hot days in New Zealand, which sounds great if you're in Wellington, but is actually not great at all, because it also means five to 10% less rain, tripling our drought occurrence, and four to six months of extreme fire danger in all of Eastern New Zealand. And of course, it means no more glaciers in New Zealand. So what are the hazards that are specific to New Zealand? Well, 75% of Kiwis live within 10 kilometers off the coast, 
65% of us live within 5 kilometers of, of the coast, and that is rising fast. We have a 1 in 100 year coastal inundation event happening every year by about 2100. Our main population centers are on the floodplains of major rivers, and our urban water supply and stormwater systems are not designed for the changing climate change extremes. We're surrounded by a changing ocean. We have important fishing, agriculture, marine recreational use and iconic often endemic wildlife. We rely on the ocean, but a dying ocean becomes our nightmare. In the last 12 months alone, warming seas have caused a breeding failure in southern Hokie, which is our most important fish export. We're relying on the ability of fresh water, urban expansion and increasing demand for water from agriculture which is going to be hit both by increased droughts and by increased floods and shifting climate zones. <clears throat> the places that are ready to dry are going to be even more dry and the places that are ready to wet are going to be even more wet. We also have the world's highest rates of endemism, which means animals that only live in New Zealand. A lot of species that are only found here are currently under the threat of extinction. For example, our penguin populations including the rock hopper, yellow-eyed and little blue penguins are plummeting. White bait may actually be extinct by 2034. Fewer than 500 pairs of wandering albatross are left in the next 20 years. And warmer temperatures already mean that we mostly have male tuatadas. Then of course there are the issues about biosecurity incursions from tropical animals that are going to move into New Zealand, causing public health and further risk to our native animals. And not only do we have some of the world's highest per capita emission rates, we increased our emissions since 1990 when we joined the Kyoto Protocol. Methane from dairy farming causes almost half of our greenhouse gas emissions, and that makes us different to most of the other industrialized nations that we're trading with. Because New Zealand is an open economy with really important trading links with Europe, Australia, the US and China, and climate change related impacts on trading partners have the potential to affect our ability to sell our goods overseas also of course causes issue, issues with social ties and migration. Because the melting ice in Greenland and the Arctic and Antarctica is associated with sea level rise. And the sea level rise will cause massive problems with coastal inundation, especially because of increased storm events, especially to countries like ours where most people live around the coast. And most of our big cities are around the coast. Climate refugees and climate related migration will become a huge issue Studies say that up to 1 billion people will be on the move by 2100, that is one in nine of every human. And it's not just between countries that's a problem, it's also within countries. If you think that over 1 million New Zealanders are currently living overseas in countries that are going to be more struck by climate change faster, we can't even deal with them all coming back home. That's our own citizens and we need to keep our country open for the Pacific whanau that is looking at losing their countries and the rising sea levels. We, <clears throat> society literally cannot cope when so many people are on the move because they can't grow or find food anymore. Some humans, of course, will survive. We don't know how many or, not, or under what Mad Max circumstances. And the oligarchs that are most responsible for causing this disaster are the ones most likely to survive it, with the people least responsible being the hardest hit. I really don't take any comfort in knowing that some rich Silicon Valley folks who bunkered themselves in on the South Island are going to be the only people who make it. In case you don't know who the guy holding the hands with the orange narcissist in chief, in chief is, it's Peter Thiel, the, the co-founder of PayPal. And he bought himself New Zealand citizenship and a massive chunk of the South Island. And if you look at some of these great articles, um, you'll be, you will see that the world elite who is now fully aware of the coming event, as they call it. And they plan to survive it, believing all of us idiots behind. They have no response other than grabbing as much land as they can in places like New Zealand, or talk about terraforming Mars. So why are we so blind to the coming catastrophe? Because it's a combination of hope and fear, and both of those are completely useless emotions when dealing with this issue. Hope is a creature of privilege, and it makes us complacent. There won't be a silver bullet technology that is going to save us from ourselves, even if we manage to get super artificial intelligence. With the goal to stop climate change and the mass extinction event, the first thing it'll do is wipe us out. Scientists are often accused of fear mongering because fear can paralyze us. But I feel it's a good thing for scientists to speak out. We are armed with the facts 
but it's okay to speak about them with emotion and with passion. It's okay to be angry and it's okay to show our frustration and it's okay to cry and to show, to show grief because it doesn't make us any less of an expert, it makes us human. So the opposite of hope is not fear or despair, it is grief. And here the sheer scale of the enormity of the problem we face gives us a perverse comfort because we're all in this together, trapped under, under a warming atmosphere with our broken hearts. We need courage, not hope, and the courage is the resolve to be the best that we can without the hope for a happy ending. Grief, after all, is the cost of being alive. So let's take a minute to let some of the enormity of what I just talked about to sink in before we're starting talking about solutions. Okay, hope dies and action begins. It's our job in the face of this unimaginable catastrophe that will hit our children and grandchildren even worse to accept our grief and to ask ourselves, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to act? This is setting us on a trajectory to move away from this narcissistic consumer culture that we've been born into and back towards engaged citizenship. We need to step up into service for the greater good and for our children and for other species and future generations. It's time to be selfless and to make sacrifices. This is a big emotional shift for most of us, but it also can be really liberating. We need to call on our governments to start a World War II style mobilization, like the one that changed the US economy within a few months when they went into um, the fight against the Nazis. But we need to do it globally. It would need a massive shift in our current socio-economic neoliberal paradigm and a systemic transformation of our energy transport and consumption systems. But this is entirely technologically feasible. It's also economically feasible and the longer, the, the longer we wait, the more expensive it's going to get. So how does change happen? Change can happen by working within the system or by interfering with the system. We've seen from past victories that working within the system can be very powerful. It works on a local scale. It can involve awareness rising, like leafleting, lobbying, like sending emails to your MP, or building a collective demand, like we've just seen so powerfully by the school strikes for climate last week. And it is really important that we acknowledge all the work of other entities and their successes so far. And we will use some of these tools here in Extinction Rebellion, our Aotearoa. But... It has limited power when there is an existential crisis that demands urgent response and there are powerful political and economic vested interests that are fighting us. So interfering with the system. What is nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience? They are essential in the most essential and difficult of crises. Nonviolent action works at a number of, le of levels and it can work because it is disruptive and it needs disruption of major cities or events that, to get the attention of our decision makers. It can be sacrificial, it makes observers sympathetic to the cause and shows people how serious you are when you go, for example, on a hunger strike or get arrested. It also can cause backfiring if our respondents, if our opponents respond disproportionately and it backfires on them if their repressors are violent towards us. And it's totally okay to be playful but to be respectful because being sympathetic and having a moral high ground makes it a lot easier to actually approach for negotiations, which is ultimately what we want to do. Here in Aotearoa, we have a really special history of non-violent civic disobedience. People have stood up to oppose, for instance, the destruction of our old forests, the use of nuclear weapons, apartheid with the Springboks tour, the Manapuri Dam, the Foreshore and Seabed Act, etc. And they were often successful reversing the course of history. Critical theory says that rebellion is justified once the establishment fails us. Do we all agree that an appropriate response to imminent climate change and the mass extinction is high stakes, disruptive civic disobedience and non-violent sacrificial action? 
Are you willing to do what it takes? Are you willing to go on a hunger strike or go to jail? To disrupt cities or to blockade infrastructure? So who are we and what do we want? The change is not happening in the way that it should. The media is not telling the truth and governments are not acting fast enough. Extinction Rebellion wants to break into the space and disrupt the status quo to get the conversation where it needs to be. We want to shift the Overton window and we want to show the world and our leaders how serious things really are. The good thing is that we're not alone. There are now 13 Extinction Rebellion groups in New Zealand alone and hundreds around the world with new ones joining us every day. So we demand that governments tell the truth about the ecological crisis, that we have zero emissions and a drawdown by 2025, and that there will be participatory democracy. So what are some of the actions that we started here in New Zealand? They ranged from the symbolic, like the mock funeral for our Earth that was held in Nelson, to the very theatrical, like the zombie apocalypse in Wellington, in the airport, and to the highly poignant, which is when Christchurch protesters turned off Environment Canterbury's water supply and were arrested for it. All of them were worth, worthwhile doing. They all got different reactions and they all had different impacts on the participants. Even though the Canterbury actions, which led to arrests, had the most media impact and also the most support from the public, it was the most serious and it had real consequences for some of our members. We may not always need to or be able to go this far. We can also increase our impact and severity of our actions over time and in response to the very severe, severe immediate threats, like when three pathogens were discovered in three Canterbury rivers. Just recently in Tauranga there was a protest that was disruptive and did block the main streets, but only for a short amount of time. And in Auckland we recently blockaded the BP headquarters until the senior manager took our letter of demands. We need people of really diverse backgrounds, ages and commitments because not everyone needs to throw themselves in front of a bus or go on a hunger strike. A main goal of Extinction Rebellion is to shift the Overton window, which means the public discourse from the status quo to the urgency of what we're facing. Our intention is to mobilize more people to join us and take a stance before it is too late. And there are many different ways in which you can help. Finally, there are some things that we need to think about that will relate specific to us as New Zealanders. For example, our self-image, our neediness to be liked, the tall poppy syndrome. We already had um, issues where Extinction Rebellion is being attacked by very small left-wing groups because we're getting so much more attention. Our over-politeness and hating confrontation. What we are talking about is confrontational and we may have to figure out how to deal and regenerate from the trauma when we get into conflicts with the public or the police. But there is also our reverence and our willingness to stand up to authority and bullies and our sympathy for the underdogs and that will help us. How are we reaching out and including and learning from Tangata and Mana Whenua and other minorities who we have just seen again suffer so terribly from real hatred? How do we move away from this just being another white middle class Pākehā movement? Also, now that we have a Labour Green government, shall we push them really hard to change our neoliberal system and move us away from a fossil fuel economy fast? Even though it could mean that we get them voted out after one term in government? Is this the right thing to do? It's something we need to talk and think about. And finally, how can we bring the public with us and not just be seen as another bunch of dirty hippies who don't do any work and who are stopping good hardworking Kiwis from going to work or from watching the footy by blocking the roads. Um, how do we get the public to actually be with us and help us fight this really important fight, this fight of our lifetime? Well, I hope that what I said here has convinced you that the time is ripe to start doing something about the imminent catastrophe that we're all facing. Because as the striking school students have shown us adults and have taught us adults so poignantly last week, it is not just about us. We are gambling away their future and, the gener and future generations' future. And we're gambling away other species' right to live on this planet. So we take a moral stance when we say we rebel for life. And here's where you can reach us and join us. Tina koutou, tina koutou, tina tata kata.